good morning. We have uh, an opportunity to talk about something this morning that I'm, I personally have a lot of passion about. But first, for those of you joining us on the stream, we are at the Trump Soho in New York with uh, an amazingly good looking and engaged audience here. So uh, you're missing out. But we, have, uh, we have several things we want to talk about, and I want to just set the stage to, uh, for the conversations today. Talent brand is something that is, uh, in some ways, greatly understood to a level of science. In other ways, still a bit of a mystery to folks. It's one of those things that people believe they should be thinking about and not exactly sure how. So we want to provide some, some visibility into people and organizations that are doing this right and the ways that we can collectively improve all of what we're doing as it relates to the brand of our, of our talent in our organizations. For me personally, I found myself about six and a half years ago with a decision. Pretty significant professional decision. I was actually in a startup. I'd been there three, three and a half years and was one of the people that helped start it. I loved it. I was passionate about it. I was VP of sales in a small company. And uh, I was reached out to by two different organizations. So I found myself in a position that I loved what I was doing and I had two other offers on the table. High quality problem. One of those was from a company that was less than 300 employees. It was not very well known at the time. Certainly the path to monetization was unsure. And for someone who leads sales organizations, that's kind of important. Um, wasn't exactly sure how that one would play out. The other offer was from a very well known, very strong brand. Actually, you're represented in the audience today. And uh, this offer was almost twice the compensation as the, as the smaller organization, um, a much better title, and a pretty sure path to success, if track record was any history. So it may surprise you that I ended up choosing the smaller organization. And I had to make a couple of choices, and I remember talking to my wife about this, of why do anything? I'm already happy, I already like doing what I'm doing, I'm very passionate about it, why do anything? Why now? And which one? And why do anything got down to the point, I started to think, my wife uh, wisely asked me the questions that helped me think through this. By the way, she's one of the most amazing people I know, so this isn't surprising to me that she asked me some wise questions. But one of them is, what do you really want to spend your time doing? And as I thought through who I am and my personal brand, which one of the things that I personally aspire to do, uh, my personal mission statement is to help people live better lives. So I put the offers through the filter of, which one will actually help me accomplish that? And I looked at the culture, the values, the mission, the vision, and the people. And that assessment made it extremely clear that the, the uncertain, smaller organization that may play out was the one that was right for me at that time in my life, based on who I am, based on what I wanted to do. Smaller organization was linked in. It's played out pretty well. I've uh, been here about six and a half years, and um, in, I think I'm in my eighth job, something like that. Spent time on two different continents, and, and it's, just been, it's been a wonderful journey. And I think in large part because who I am, what I care about, what I'm really passionate about, aligns with who LinkedIn is. And so that match was right. It wouldn't have been right necessarily for someone else. It was right for me at that time for that role. And to me, that's talent brand. The difference in the choices that I had in front of me wasn't about a good company versus a bad company or a medium company versus a great company. It was about connecting talent with opportunity in a way that harmonizes. When you have two instruments in harmony, everything goes well together. When there's discord, it's just doesn't, it just doesn't play out well. And I think all of us know when you're in a role, when you're doing something, that you feel like you were made to do this. Like this is what I was designed to do. The energy level, the joy you have in that, actually even your ability to shut off when it's time to shut off, all of those things work well. And you get to a point where, to me, what I consider success is when you're excited to go to work in the morning and you're excited to go home in the evening. When you've got that design, you're in a good situation. And talent brand, to me, is about organizations lining up with individuals in a way that that works for everyone involved. So we want to spend some time on that, but talent brand really changes the game. Because without it, you're going to be comparing opportunities, candidates compare opportunities, on a spreadsheet. Maybe not literally, maybe they're not all geeks like me, but it's salary to salary, it's, it's title to title, it's benefits to benefits, location to location, 
and you go down the T-charts and make a decision. But brand changes all of that. If there's a brand you resonate with, you can overlook a lot of those things. So I think about brand a little bit in the way that I think most of us have, have heard in the last several years, people talk about talent brand similar to marketing. So the function of recruiting is becoming more and more similar to the function of sales and marketing. And if you think about what marketers do, they typically attach an emotion to a product. Think about the last automobile ad you saw. It probably didn't go through feature function of that vehicle. And it probably it, it portrays some type of emotion. The open road, the freedom, power, prestige, whatever the things are that they believe is going to resonate with the buyer, it's an emotion. And you know, I find it interesting that most of us actually connect with those, those advertisements pretty well. We want that thing that they're portraying. And actually most of us, in North America, almost all of us drive vehicles. And we usually kind of appreciate that and we like it. And yet, we buy them, we buy them relatively frequently, we like them, but the process of acquiring one is one of the least desired experiences that we have. Is that true? I mean, how many of you can't wait to buy your next car? I mean, this is the process itself. It's kind of painful. I use an example here of Tesla because I think one of the things that they're doing really interestingly, and we'll see if it scales, but the buying process, if you talk to anyone who's gone through the buying process for buying one of these vehicles, it's dramatically different than what anyone else has done. And whether they chose to buy one or didn't choose to buy one, most of the people I know that have been th on that journey say great things about the company and about the way they interacted, and it's a dramatically different experience than any other vehicle that they've interacted with before. Now imagine if I had just described your recruiting practices and the candidate journey in your, your organization. Whether they chose to join you, whether you chose them as a candidate or not, if they said that experience was one of the best experiences I've ever had in deciding whether I was a fit for a company or not. That to me would be a great talent brand. So not only, so for those of us that like to measure things, self-included, there's some real practical reasons why talent brand matters. Number one is cost. Of companies with a strong talent brand versus companies with a weaker talent brand, on the average, their cost to hire is 50% lower. A company with a strong talent brand versus a company with a weak talent brand. Their turnover rates in the first six months of employment are reduced by 28%. And if you think through that, that makes a lot of sense. If you have the right person matched to the right opportunity and there's that cultural fit and the brand fit, it's pretty likely you'll have lower turnover. Uh, I was surprised that, that, that the turnover was reduced by 28% by, by this much. That's a lot. And from a competitive standpoint, when you ask organizations, what are you most concerned about that your competitors will do? Number one concern is that they'll get talent brand right, which tells us what? Probably we don't have it right. But that's the number one competitive threat we feel is when someone else has talent brand more correct than we do, it's going to better resonate with candidates. So I think it's pretty obvious. When you get the right feeling, the right opportunity in front of the right people, things work together very well. And when you can collect and assemble the right group of people, suddenly the talent and the opportunity that have come together are greater than the sum of their collective parts. They, they can do more together when you bring people into uh, a scenario that everyone fits and everyone works well together in. So we want to, this morning, part of what we want to do is we want to announce some winners of what we call the in-demand list. This is kind of fun for those of us, Ryan mentioned that, that we sit on a, a pretty significant amount of data and as a data geek, I find it fascinating the number of interactions. So LinkedIn has over 300 million members. Members are joining over two members per second. And think of the amount of data that we, that we sit on as far as the way people interact with brands. For example, these in-demand ratings, we have over 11 billion interactions of people with companies. And out of that, you can start to correlate some pretty interesting things. The ways that people engage with an organization, whether they p respond or don't respond, the way in which they pay attention, who they follow, who they interact with, and how. And looking at that amount of data is pretty fascinating that finally there is a way to put some science behind the art of a brand, specifically talent brand, and understanding 
what companies resonate with individuals that they aspire to recruit and which ones don't. I think the cool thing that, that we've noticed is that actually any organization, regardless of size of company, regardless of industry, can be strong in this area. That was one of the first aha moments for me a few years ago. We started to see thought leaders who really took this seriously and started reaching out and aspiring to be successful in this area. It was almost regardless of company, regardless of industry, regardless of situation, that you can move the needle here. So the good news is this isn't necessarily even about your consumer brand. This is about making a conscious decision to connect with the people that you care most about. And we've seen companies who have come from a place where they're, for whatever reason, they've had, from a macro brand standpoint, they've had brand challenges. And we've seen them do successful things with their talent brand. And we've seen those that have a massively Im impressive consumer brand translate that into a talent brand that's also impressive. So kind of regardless of where you are, there's ability to win here. And I think most excitingly today, we're going to have some first-person stories of people who have been down this journey and people who have successfully been down the journey. So 28% of the people on this list of the top most in-demand employers in North America are from right here in New York. Impressive. 46% of them are come from three industries, tech, telecom, and media. And 22% of them come from organizations with less than 5,000 employees. So 11 of the 50 have less than 5,000 employees in their organization. Talent brand isn't about the number of people you have and the, and the awareness of your company. It's also mostly about engagement. How well does what you do and what you say resonate with those that you care most about? So North America's top 50 in-demand employers starting to come across your screen now. These companies didn't sort of land on the list by mistake. I've been fortunate enough to interact with a lot of these organizations personally, and I can tell you that a lot of time, effort, and focus has gone into assuring that what they're doing resonates well with the people they care most about. So, so for those of you on this list, congratulations. It's a big field. It's a big field to go from. I love watching people look at this list because you, you, you get some reactions that are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then they look at one and they're like, who? <laughs> and then they look and for, who's the first company you look for? Your own, right? Are we up there? And if so, there's a sense of pride, and if not, it's how do we get there? Well, today, we'll focus on the latter. How do we get there? It's not about this list. It's not about whether you're in the top 50 or the top 10 or the top 2,000. It's about is your talent brand effective in accomplishing the goals that you have for your organization? Are you able to connect talent with opportunity in the way that you want to that, it's, that aims towards the goals that your organization has? So I want to tell you three quick stories and then introduce someone who's going to talk to you about a personal journey of building a talent brand really from the grassroots of building a successful, being successful in this, in this capacity. So the first one's L'Oreal. One of the things that I find that I think is interesting that they did is they started a campaign called Are You In? And they've asked candidates to share an in word that describes them and their personal profile. And then they've asked employees to share an in moment that's indicative of the experience that they personally have in their job at their, in their organization. They've had over 8,000 in moments now, 8,000 in moments, over 40,000 page views on this microsite. And so you have a group of candidates who are able to uh, get a picture of what it's like, not just at the company, but in that specific role. What, is it, what does it feel like? What does that person really appreciate? And by the way, you have an engaged group of employees, most important to me, was noticing how engaged their employees are in telling that story and what it's like to be here. They have a bunch of brand ambassadors that are sharing that experience with other people. Because when we work in a company, we want to attract other people that are attracted to the same thing as us. So I think it's impressive what they're doing in engaging their current employee base with the candidates that are interested in their organization. 
NBC Universal takes that one step further, and what they do is they create a time for uh, their business leaders to interact with candidates that are interested in their organization live. So they call this feedback. And they get a chance to hear and engage with, imagine as a candidate, you get a chance to hear and engage with business leads, not with the recruiting team, with business leads in this organization. What do they think about? What do they care about? What works? What doesn't work? wonder if I'm a fit for this organization. And imagine if you could have those types of, of questions answered prior to really engaging in a, in a heavy recruiting process. I mean, imagine if most of the questions and the what ifs and the uncertainties were dealt with prior to you and your teams engaging in the recruiting process. It makes the conversation so much more effective. When you start to realize that the issues that are dealt with with a strong talent brand, it's no wonder that the cost to hire is reduced so much because the amount of interactions are reduced dramatically when you can get that brand message out. So NBC Universal, I think, is doing a really interesting job with that. The third example, final example, is Salesforce. One of the things that organizations have, the, that becomes obvious quickly is who's best at getting our talent brand out? Who's best at telling our story of what it's like to be here? It's usually people who are already here, right? Employees. And for the most part, if you have a company that people love to, to work for, people uh, are great at what they do and, and they, they love it and they're the ones that tell their friends about it, they're typically more than willing to help get the word out. But I've got to be honest with you, most of us don't have the time and effort, in my case, skill, to create great content. And so what Salesforce does is it provides them little sound bites, little snippets that, that others can share out. They'll email out to a set of employees and even give them suggested content to share in their social networks and in other channels. They serve it up on a silver platter, if you will, for that person to be able to extend who they are as a person, as a, as a part of that organization, and also it helps get the talent brand out there. Make it easy for your employees. The most impressive asset you have as it relates to social capital, make it easy for them to tell the story. And that's what Salesforce does, is they're offering up to them content that they can redistribute out. There are a lot of great stories, and uh, I'm not going to go through 50 of them. You'll be happy to know. But I think the point is, when you start to see companies doing things that are, that are innovative and that are creative and that are successful, that work for them, you'll find some of those that really resonate with you and your brand. But I think part of the point of hearing stories and, and anecdotes and methods that people are using is you have to determine whether that fits with you. Your brand is going to be different than your brand. And so making sure that the, the, the method you use to get your, your, your uh, brand out there also resonates with who you are as an organization. I love hearing some of these stories that are like crazy out there, like really funky stuff to engage people. But there are some organizations that that would just be, create such discord with who they are as a company that that's not appropriate either. Some of you are in industries that, are, that have various types of regulation and ways in which you can and can't interact. Other of you have like no holds barred, you can do whatever you want, relatively. So I would encourage you to find those things that work well with your organization, find the people doing things that are successful with them, and, and we want to aspire to pull people together like we have physically in this room and like those of you virtually on the stream. And this is a community. One of the things that LinkedIn aspires to do is to build communities where we can help people be more productive and more successful. So one of the things I hope that you get out of this morning is not only the content, which I'm excited to hear what you have the rest of the day, what you have lined up the rest of the day, but also the people in the room. There are a lot of people here who are working on the same set of challenges. We all took time out of our schedule today, some cases to travel in, and other cases just to commute in, to be here this morning and realize that we all collectively have this is a topic that matters. You're all busy. You have a prioritization set of things and the way you spend your time. And this is something you've chosen to spend your time with this morning. So I'd encourage you not only to uh, lean into the content, but also to the contacts and other people that are here that you can, that you can learn things from.